Hello again and welcome to another episode of the Ominous Origins Podcast with me, Casey. Of course, this episode is still brought to you by the wonderful people over at MorbidlyBeautiful.com. Morbidly Beautiful is your one-stop shop for all things horror content related from interviews, reviews, top ten lists, and of course, everything in between. Now, we're going to get back to some true crime this week. I know, I know, I jump back and forth all the time. Get used to it. This week, we're going to be looking at a very sad case that's fairly recent in our history, especially for... Uh, true crime case on this podcast. This took place in June of 2010, and this has to do with the disappearance of a young boy called Kyron Horman. Now, he vanished broad daylight early in the school day. There's a bunch of suspects. There's a bunch of weird, suspicious activity from a lot of different people. So we're going to just dive right in. This is Kyron Horman and his disappearance. Ominous. Ominous. It is an adjective. Sounds like someone breathing. Ominous. As I said, this is kind of a different era for us. We don't usually look at cases from the 2000s, let alone the 2010s. This is only 12 years ago. In fact, I have a friend who was born at the same time as Kyron Horman here. So it's just crazy to think that he would be a full-grown adult now had he had never gone missing. But let's just jump right into what happened. It was shortly after 8 a.m. on Friday, June 4th, 2010, when seven-year-old second grader Kyron Horman arrived at Portland's Skyline Elementary School. It was the day of the science fair, and he was getting his project all ready and set up with the help of his stepmom. Now, it's important to know here that a fellow student reported seeing him at 9 a.m. near the school's south entrance. Horman didn't really report to any classes that day either, nor did he board the school bus, to come home later. In fact, since that 9am spotting, he had never been seen by anyone since. Now this is a very disturbing case, because it does involve a minor. This kid was 7 years old, which is heartbreaking. So what happened to Kyron Horman? Well, we don't know for sure. There is a photograph, the last known photograph, taken by his stepmom, Terry, on June 4th. 2010. It's of him at a science fair. He's got a tree frog exhibit, a little diorama thing, and he's wearing a CSI shirt. Now, there is some speculation that this photograph is photoshopped in some way, shape, or form. It looks a little weird. I'm not going to lie. I do have some expertise in Photoshop, and I'm going to say some things just don't look right. His arm is completely missing, but it could just be tucked behind his back. He's wearing a very loose-fitting shirt. The lighting doesn't look entirely right, but it doesn't look entirely off either. It's very strange, this photograph, though. There's clearly a flash reflection in his glasses, which does not look like a cell phone camera flash. But this was 2010. I don't remember what kind of phones were back then, to be completely honest. They weren't great, and the picture quality is not fantastic, so it could very well have been a point-and-shoot digital camera. The only thing is, I don't see a flash reflection on anything else. The board behind him is of a reflective-ish material. There isn't much separation between him and that. There's no bokeh or background blur so it was not a very expensive camera anyway we're looking way too deep into this photograph there's better experts than me to look into it now the last photo as i said he was ironically wearing a csi shirt he had a very keen interest in forensic science and on the day he disappeared he was wearing that shirt which is again a weird coincidence if nothing else now, according to basically everybody, it was Horman's stepmother, Terry Moulton, who was the last family member to see the boy alive as he walked down the school's hallway to a class that Friday morning. However, later on, she did fail a polygraph test on the day's events. Not once, but twice. It's important to note that polygraph tests are not admissible in court because they can be swayed by a billion different factors. They're not easy to beat, but they can be beaten. They're very easy to be manipulated in a very abstract sense. If you're nervous, if you start regular and you get asked the question, what's your name, and you answer regularly, but as soon as those questions start to come, you become nervous because, well, you're being questioned about the disappearance of a young boy, your stepson. It's only natural to become nervous and potentially even fail the polygraph. But it does not look good that somebody failed it. The stepmom, the last person to see this young boy alive, did fail that polygraph, and that's weird. That's also not a good sign. Kyron's father and this stepmother have divorced since. In a strange, I don't even know if it's a strange twist, but in some sort of twist anyway. It's only natural, I guess. Maybe not even a twist at all that Terry's lawyers 
filed a document saying that the father should also be a suspect in this case. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves right now. Let's just look at the most non-biased opinions and sequences of events of that last day of Chiron Horman. These detailed series of events and timelines come courtesy of the Oregonian, which actually put Molten at two different grocery stores until 10.10 that morning. However, between then and 11.39 a.m., the stepmother has no alibi. Naturally, she claims to have been driving rural roads with her infant daughter, Kiara, trying to soothe her ear infection before checking into a 24-hour fitness about 11 miles away at 11.39, and she stayed there for about an hour. Then at 1.21 p.m., Molten claimed to have arrived home, logged into Facebook, and posted photos of Horman at school with his science project from that morning. Then, Kyron Horman's father, Kane, joined Molten to meet the school bus at 3.30 p.m., but Horman naturally did not get off the bus. When they drove to the school and found out that Horman had been marked absent all day, they had the secretary call 911, and so began the largest missing person search in Oregon history. At the heart of the search for Kyron Horman is the relationship between his parents and stepmother. His biological parents, Kane and Desiree Young, Divorce from the boy was small, and the two shared custody until Desiree became severely ill with kidney problems. She was forced to move back with her parents and gave full-time custody of Horman to Kane until she fully recovered. Kane then married Terry Moulton, with whom he had a daughter, Kiara. But things were apparently not going too well in that marriage either, according to emails that Moulton sent to her friends. After police showed her these email messages, Young said the messages revealed that Moulton had a severe hatred for Kyron. There's a quote here that says, she blames a lot of the marital problems between Kane and herself on Chiron. It was a huge point of contention in their marriage and she had expressed in great detail her hatred for Chiron, Young said. I now believe without a shadow of a doubt that not only is she capable of hurting Chiron, but that is clear that she could have hurt him in the worst possible way. Initially, there was no real interest in Moulton as a suspect. Sources indicate that there was a probability of deception during her first polygraph and gaps in the timeline she gave for the day Horman vanished, which is all very suspicious. Yet none of these details amounted to anything more than suspicion, until about a month into the investigation when a bombshell was dropped. For 10 days, Horman's case was considered a missing persons one, but then investigators announced it was officially a criminal investigation. In July 2010, a local landscaper who Moulton previously hired showed up at the police station. He told authorities that about six months prior to Horman's disappearance, Moulton Horman offered him money to kill her husband. Detectives shared the landscaper's account with Kane, and he left the house on June 26th with the couple's 19-month-old daughter. He promptly hired a family law attorney and filed divorce papers and a restraining order against Moulton. Unfortunately, police have no other suspects, and there are little to no updates on the Karen Horman case today. Quote, they found no clues, they found nothing, Horman's father told KPIC News in 2015. All the searches to date that I know of, both private and by the sheriff's office or the search and rescue teams, there's been no piece of evidence forensically linked to the case. So they found nothing. So he's not around here. So the question is, where is he? End quote. To this day, the Multima County Sheriff's Department is still actively seeking any and all leads in the case, but without a breakthrough, the authorities are still no closer to solving Kyron Horman's eerie disappearance even after more than a decade. I want to go over some of the timelines that Terry claimed to have happened in the time where Kyron disappeared. Now, she stated to the police that after leaving the school at around 8.45 a.m. after helping him set up for the science fair, she ran errands to two different Fred Meyer grocery stores until about 10.10 10 a.m., which we went over. Between then... At 11.39, she stated that she was driving her daughter around in an attempt to use motion of the vehicle to soothe her toddler's earache. Suspicion number one, I'm going to come back to that in a second. She then said she went to the local gym and exercised for about an hour, and by 1.21, she'd arrived home and posted photos of Kyron at the science fair on Facebook. So let's take a look at that more than an hour missing between 10.10am 10, and 11.39am when she said she was driving her daughter around to soothe an earache. Some reports have her driving on a rural road, which is convenient, where maybe cell phone signals and GPS locating devices might not quite reach those areas, especially back in 2010, when the technology was still newish. Not quite infancy, but it wasn't what it is today. A little bit harder to track, very suspicious. Also, rural roads 
are a great place to hide and dump a body. That's suspicion number two. Now, she could very well have been driving around with her toddler to soothe an earache. I don't know if motion really helps with something like that. I'm not a doctor. But it does sound weird, does it not? A rural road for more than an hour. And then off to the gym. Like nothing happened. That, if she did do this, that is one of the most terrifying aspects of this case. That's kind of like psychopath behavior 101. You do something terrible, then you go on with the rest of your day like nothing ever happened. I also read, and I don't remember where I read this, but there was another person in Terry's car. Somebody that we don't know who it was, be it another man or woman, but there were reports that her car was spotted with another adult in the passenger seat. And that does bring me to the point of when she tried to hire somebody to kill her husband, their landscaper, a man by the name of Rodolfo Sanchez. Apparently he was offered a lot of money to kill her husband. Sanchez even testified to this in a deposition that Terry approached him to help kill her husband in January of 2010, five months before Kyron's disappearance. Naturally, in her own deposition, Terry denied the charge. Investigators convinced Sanchez to confront Terry while wearing an audio surveillance device, but they were unable to obtain any evidence and could not make an arrest. On June 28th, Kane filed for divorce from Terry. He also got that restraining order, which was very smart. The divorce was obviously granted, and Terry was eventually given visitation rights with her daughter, but they were supervised, which is, again, probably for the best considering she very well may have killed Kyron. Now, it was here that I read this. Bruce McCain, the former sheriff of the local county sheriff's office, told CBS News that somebody had seen two people sitting inside Terry's truck outside Skyline Elementary School the day of the disappearance. This was seen by at least two people as well. Now, this former sheriff, Bruce McCain, said, The identity of that second person, if he or she existed, could be critical in determining what happened to Kyron after 9 a.m. on June the 4th. Also, in July of 2010, the county grand jury subpoenaed several friends of Terry, including a woman by the name of Dee Dee Spicer, whom Young and Kane described as having been in close communication with Terry and, quote, providing Terry with support and advice that is not in the best interest of our son, end quote. According to law enforcement, Spiker was extremely cooperative and allowed a search of her property and car, as well as enduring three hours of questioning from detectives. On the day of Kyron's disappearance, Dee Dee abruptly left her work gardening for a homeowner in Germantown Road in northwest Portland around 11.30 a.m. and returned around 90 minutes later. She also allegedly helped Terry purchase an untraceable cell phone, during this time, Spicer told journalists, quote, There's a horror that my friend is going through. If I thought for a second that she was capable of foul play, I would not have been there. She would not have been my friend in the first place. In early August of 2010, both Young and Kane were subpoenaed and testified during the grand jury hearing, as was the school principal of Skyline Elementary. In December 2010, it was reported by this wonderful new little newspaper, The Oregonian that the grand jury had yet to provide compelling evidence yielding a potential indictment. By November 29, 2010, search efforts in Kyron's case had cost an estimated $1.4 million, according to county commissioners, and yielded 4,257 tips. In May 2017, it was reported by Portland Station KGW that a secret grand jury panel continued to hear evidence in Kyron's case and had convened on multiple occasions. During the report, Kyron's case was described as still active and ongoing. Two months later, in July 2017, law enforcement conducted further searches along Skyline Boulevard, but the searches yielded no response. In June 2018, Young posted on the official Find Kieran Horman Facebook page, saying, quote, Stay tuned, something big is coming, I promise you. And that was the last we heard of that. In June of 2012... Kyron's biological mother filed a civil lawsuit against Terry claiming that she was responsible for the disappearance of Kyron. The lawsuit attempted to prove that Terry had kidnapped Kyron on the day he disappeared. Young sought $10 million in damages. On August 15th, 2012, a federal court judge denied a motion by Terry to delay the lawsuit. In early October 2012, Spicer refused to answer any of the 142 questions posed to her during a deposition regarding Young's lawsuit. Among these questions were several regarding Spicer's whereabouts on June 4th, 2010, and her contact with Terry that day. 
She also declined to identify a photo of Chiron, whether she had met him before or not, and whether she knew his father, Kane. During testimony provided by Kane in a separate hearing at the same year, he stated that police had told him they have more probable cause to think Terry Horman was involved in Chiron's disappearance than they did two years ago. On July 30th, 2013, it was announced that Young had dropped the lawsuit against Terry, so not to interfere with the ongoing police investigation. So what do you think happened to Chiron? Was it Terry? Well, I mean, all signs point to yes, really. I mean, I can't think of another suspect. The only thing that throws a wrench in this is that he was spotted at 9 a.m. in the school by another student. But that could have just been a misremembrance or misidentification. Who knows? These are children we're talking about. Their memories aren't the most reliable. But in the end, this is a very sad case. When a child goes missing in any way, shape, or form, it's never a good thing. When there's a parent involved, it's even worse. Now, there still isn't any updates for this case, sadly, and I don't think there ever will be. If he's alive, he's off in a distant land somewhere. But there's a good chance that between 10.10am 10, 10 and 11.39am on June 4th, 2010, Terry Moulton took young Chiron out to the middle of nowhere, killed him, and disposed of his body. That's all we can think of. That's the only thing. There were rewards, there were search parties, but nothing ever turned up. It's just one of those sad cases that we'll never get an answer to. But we can all hope that it does happen one day, that we get answers, and that we get a confession, or a body, or something, some sort of closure for the family, except for Terry, because I think fuck her. But I don't want to jump to conclusions, but fuck her. Anyway, that's going to do it for me this week. My name is Casey, and this has been the Ominous Origins Podcast. If you like what you heard, please feel free to leave a five-star rating on Spotify. You can do so on the mobile app. If you do, feel free to let me know through any sort of messaging technique, and I will give you a shout-out on the show if that's something you want. You can still leave a five-star review on iTunes or Apple Podcast, and if you do, I will give you a shout-out as well. If you want to contact me or follow along on social media, you can do so on Instagram at Ominous Origins Pod, on Facebook at Horror Shots, or on Twitter at Horror Shots Prod is in productions. But that is going to do it for me this week. Until next time, have a good one.